Okay, so what I want to talk to you guys about tonight, of course, was the space flight mission and what it actually takes. Um, but before we get to that, I want to make it incredibly clear I'm a plant biologist. The space flight's cool, but I'm a plant biologist. So what we work on, what the lab works on, and many of my lab members are here, uh, and they'll be happy to talk to you. They're scattered around with the space station over here, our model, and the model of the rocket that we launched. Um, so you guys are welcome to talk to them about things and take a look at these pieces um, as we move through. Um, and I have some other things to play with. But predominantly, my lab is a molecular lab. We work on genomics, the genes involved in signaling of gravity, and the proteins. And we'll talk a little bit more about that and how we set this experiment up. But what I'm really interested in is how gravity signals plant organ position. If you think about plants at all, other than walking on them or eating them, if you look at them, typically we think of the plant goes up, the shoot goes up, and the roots go down. But that's not necessarily true. If you think about a hanging basket, the shoots are actually going down. If you look carefully, many of them at the very tips, they're trying to go up, but predominantly they're going down. So the idea of how do you actually, how do plants actually sense and signal gravity. And that's what we're looking for in my lab. Now, of course, what's the best control for gravity? Every experiment needs a control. Typically what we do in the lab is we take a plant, and this is our plant of choice, Arabidopsis. It's a model plant, it has a very small genome, and it's really small in size, which also makes it good for space flight. Typically what we do to study the effects of gravity is we turn them on their side. We change their orientation to gravity, and then we look to see what happens. But that's not the best control. So what is the best control for spaceflight? No gravity. No gravity. Or the best control for gravity. No gravity. Spaceflight. And we were fortunate enough to get a spaceflight opportunity, and I want to kind of go through with you sort of how we did this and what the procedure is. People think, oh, you got to fly an experiment. And they think it's like magic. You just go and you give them your stuff and it goes. Not so quick. So this is our experiment. It was called Brick 20. Brick is biological research in a canister. And we are the 20th brick to fly. So we're Brick 20. And this is the design. We designed this. Um, sticker, if you will, our own kind of patch for the brick experiments. If you want to see those more, there's one here, and some of the students have the t-shirts from the brick mission, the, the sticker, the design is on the back of that. Um, this was a big event. <laughs> we had t-shirts and stickers and everything. It was a big event. Um, so the process itself, first of all, of course, you have to write a proposal. There are no pictures of writing a proposal. It's really quite boring. But you write a proposal. Then you send it off for review. And a bunch of people stand in a room and talk about whether they like it or not. And then finally you get a phone call. And usually if you get a phone call, it's good news. Right, guys? The bad news, they just send by email. <laughs> uh, so you got a I got a phone call. And the big questions are, gee, they liked your proposal. This looks really good, but we need to define a few of the parameters, what we're going to do. So we're going to show you sort of what we flew. There are only certain types of hardware, and you really have to match your experiment to what's available. They will design hardware, and NASA's great about that. They'll design hardware for an experiment if it's necessary, but that really takes a long time. <laughs> they have custom-made uh, hardware. So the first step in the whole process is called definition. We're just defining parameters. That we do here. So once we pass definition, then we go to SVT. You have to get used to these acronyms really quickly. So SVT is a science verification test. Then if you pass that, you go to payload verification. That's really the dress rehearsal for spaceflight. Then if you pass that, 
you get to fly. So we're going to go through some of that process for you. So definition phase, step one. The first thing we had to do was define what the parameters were that we actually needed to address. The first piece, we planted our seedlings. Those are Arabidopsis seedlings. They're actually on 60 millimeter plates. You guys want to take some and pass them around? There's a few more. I'll get these started up here. So these are Arabidopsis seed. What you're going to realize is they're tiny. <laughs> Again, good for space flight. So the first question that we got to was cold stasis. They said, so how long can your experiment stay in cold stasis? And I said, what? And they said, well, you know, if the flight gets delayed, it's going to be cold before it launches. We launch seeds, not plants, so that it doesn't go through the launch. And then the plants germinate on the station. So the first question is, how long can you wait? So we had to do that experiment. How long could we wait before the seedlings were going to germinate even in the cold? Then we needed to determine how long we wanted them to stay in fixative. There are all these pieces and parts. This is a very different type of experiment. When you do experiments here on Earth, you do it, it doesn't work out quite right, or the, the parameters are a little wrong, and you can do it over. Not encouraged with NASA. If you're going to fly an experiment, they'd really like to have everything lined out first, so all the do-overs have to be done at the beginning. This was kind of really hard on my students because even as we got closer to launch, it's like, well, we could do it. It's like, no, you can't. We're not changing anything. It's defined. This is what we're going to fly. So we had several different questions, uh, about four of them with the question marks there. This is Colin, one of the students in the lab. These are our simulated bricks. I know, they're coffee mugs. No, they're not. They're bricks. So what we did to simulate the idea of having no air and no light was take our plants and put them in the bricks. So you can see him taking the bricks out of the growth room where we have the warm temperatures bringing them back in the lab, putting them in the fridge, taking them out of the fridge, simulating all the pieces and parts. There were 24 experiments that we did. 72,000 seedlings, roughly, lost their life in the pursuit of space flight. 72,000 little seedlings. I'll show you guys what some of the seedlings look like. Keeps my students busy. Just pass them around. Start them somewhere and let them go. So, step one. And we got data back. I always say I break my own rules, right? It's great to be the moderator and the presenter. Um, no data. Well, there's the data. Just to know that we did it. So, we got answers to all these questions. Exactly how long we could do, what we were going to do, what our experimental parameters were, check. We're through with definition. Step one. This took four or five months. And actually, that's a really short definition phase. They had a launch they wanted us to make, and we were being kind of shoved down to make that launch. They, the timeline was pretty condensed. So then we went to SVT, science verification. If we put this stuff in the hardware that we wanted to fly, could it still be usable? Was it still going to be valid? For this, we got to go to Kennedy. Ta-da, there's Kennedy. This is the building that we were in, the International Space Station Processing Facility. We were like kids in a candy store. We took picture after picture after. The people at NASA are great. They just kind of go, so you take pictures walking. So there's the hallway, a little disappointing. You're at NASA. This should be like, I don't know, brightly colored something, right? Well, we did find the brightly colored. The door caution. Every door has this caution swing thing, and they all have the picture of the International Space Station. 
There's our lab. They actually give us a lab. We have a lab designated for our experiment to use. And that's my collaborator, Darren Lussie. He's at Southern Illinois at Edwardsville. There's the official sign. Yeah, I know it's photocopied on color, but it's official. It's real. Brick 20. So then we go to the business of actually setting up the experiment. Pouring the plates. You guys have seen the plates, the auger that's in the plates. You can see that Darren's actually pouring the plates, which is what we normally do in the lab. And then somebody said, how much is in the plates? And I thought, hmm, I don't know about that much. <laughs> right. So we actually, you'll see later on, we're actually pipetting it out so they're all completely even. And we know how much is in there. So these are the plates all laid out for SVT. There's about 22 of them. This is me. I wasn't behind the camera this time. What I'm doing is actually plating seeds. So if you saw the little plate with the seeds on it, you saw them kind of spread out. You may have wondered how we managed to do that. We weren't placing the seeds individually, obviously. Well, this is how you do it. We sterilize the seeds. Everything has to be sterilized. You sterilize the seeds and you put them on filter paper. And then quite literally what I do or we do is just rub the paper together and the seeds fall off and sprinkle on the plates. Okay? So there they all wrapped all wrapped up just like the ones I sent around. They're in their light treatment. We're getting ready to go. Then the next step is to put it into the hardware. This is the first piece of the hardware that we're going to fly in. This is a petri dish fixation unit, a PDFU. How many people do you think it takes to take that plate and put it into that piece of hardware? One? <laughs> How about a room full? Those are all the people, I'm there, those are all the people that it takes to load it into the hardware. There's somebody to call off each step, there's somebody to check to be sure that each step is done, there are the two of us that are actually working on this process. And then there are these people that are actually going to put the fixative into the tube so that it's ready to go for launch. So here we are actually at the bench, getting the seedlings, taking the cover off. Now, if you noticed our sticker here, if you got to look at it at all, what it says across the top is ready for the science, which you may think, during this process, the NASA uh, technician actually puts the hardware together. So you can see all these pieces. There's about 25 pieces, 26 pieces that go into this, putting this piece of hardware together, because it all has to be sterile as well. Then they say to me, then they say, ready for the science. They don't say, where are the seedlings, give me the plate, ready for the science. So we heard this over, and that became sort of the logo for um, our space flight, ready for the science. So there's the first one all made up. There's five. They go into a brick. There we are. Now they're loading this. So they're actually injecting fixative into a channel on the side so that it can be deployed in space to fix this, this tissues. Then it gets loaded into the brick itself. This is the brick. So there are five PDFUs and a data logger. So we can actually log every temperature, everything that these seedlings experience. This gets all locked down and weighed. And then the experiment begins. Now, our seedlings grew for three days. We had a maximum of five days, a minimum of three. We had to figure all that timing out as well. So, but unbelievably, the experiment took over a month. Yes? No, the, the data loggers, they measure all the environmental parameters. I'm sorry, the question was, did I set the parameters for what, what came out of the data logger? No. Those are just, all it is is 
environmental parameters, temperature, humidity, those kinds of things to make sure that all of the bricks are uh, the same and that we know what happened. We actually use that information from the data loggers to downlink to Earth and run the ground controls. The ground controls are on a two-day uh, lag. So they sync all the material, they, and they download all the information, and then they have a chamber that is set up to run specifically on that downlinked information so that it parallels exactly. So the experiment begins. It runs for three days. And then they freeze it, because we're going to freeze it on space, on station. We actually put it in what's called the Melfi freezer. Um, and it's a minus 80 freezer. So then it comes back. Well, there's one of these sheets. You sign off on all this. All this stuff goes down. You have all the instructions. And you're, I'm reading down this sheet, because they've always said, we'll freeze it on station, and we'll give it back to you frozen. There was a glitch in that. Somewhere down that little list, it said, we're going to thaw it for 24 hours. I said, what? You're not thawing my stuff. You can't thaw this. They said, oh, but we have to. We have to be able to get the screws out and get it out of the hardware. So this created quite a bit of discussion. How could we do this? Could we do this? Well, in the end, what we did, you can see it frozen here. Um, is we actually thought it just enough to get to it. So we're actually in a cold room. We're basically in your refrigerator. We're at four degrees. We're in a big cold room with all of these frozen things going, nope, not yet. Nope, not yet. Freezing. You'll see some more of this. You can see her gloves, her coat. She's got a big winter coat. We're supposed to be sterile again. So we have all this clothing underneath lab coats. So this is. That Petri dish, you can see it here frozen. It's still so frozen we can't get the top off, so we're having to wait. So once we get it thawed, then we're going to wrap it up and we're going to put it in a box of dry ice to ship it back to me. So we analyzed the data. We got it back. We analyzed the data. It's a go. Life is good. We just passed SVT. Doesn't sound like that big a deal. But it was, <laughs> especially when we have put all this time and effort into it and we're waiting to make sure, did the seedlings germinate? It's always a question. Now we're to PVT. Back to NASA. This time I took the students. So Darren and I each took a student to go with us now that we know what's going to happen. So these are the two students that went with us, Sarah Ann from um, Southern Illinois and Proma, who is here tonight as well, uh, from Ohio University. You can see them. I'm not sure what they're doing in that picture. Something. Here, Proma's pouring plates. You notice now we actually have a pipe header, and we're actually pouring them exactly the same amount in each of the plates. Kind of same setup. Here we are. More plating of seeds. Back to integration. It takes about four hours to do those 22 plates to build it all up. For me, when I'm sitting here, they actually expect me to sit there still <laughs> for four hours. Yes, sorry. The brick, the brick is a brick. It's the one, the same ones that are going to fly. Uh, so it is the space, fl space flight hardware. So it's the same exact uh, piece of hardware that we may fly in. They have several of them, and they just rotate them through. This is one of the problems with some of these and the timing of some of these, because if there's some that are in flight and some that are being used for ground control, then you start to have to figure out the numbers and how many you actually have that you can use. So that became an issue uh, as our flight got delayed. So this is integration a little more up close. I'm sorry? Yep. No, 
No, once we get to SVT, PVT, he asked if we prepared it here or there. Once we get to SVT, PVT, and launch, we're doing everything at Kennedy. So we're flying down. I made 10 trips to Kennedy between July and January last year. So this is integration up close. You can see, I think this is Sarah Ann. Um, literally just putting the plate in the hardware and then sealing up the hardware. And there we go again. <sighs> Filling them all with um, fixative. Back to the bricks, getting loaded into the bricks. Now we've got to weigh them. Put them in the fridge. And then they're going to go to the growth chamber. We're still on ground. We're a PVT, but we're still on the ground. We haven't gone anywhere yet. And the experiment begins. They do exactly the simulation, everything, how long it's going to stay in cold, how long it's going to come out into the warm, and then back again. And here we are to deintegration. Pulling them back out, our little frozen guys, pulling them back out of the hardware. So, and then we're going to take them, we're going to bring them back. They shipped them to us. That's the FedEx truck. They drove it overnight, two drivers directly. Uh, this is the box. This is from PV2, PVT. When you get this, it's kind of exciting. <laughs> this hasn't gone anywhere yet. It's still on the ground and we're still excited. It's like, oh. Um, so then we have to do the data. We have to extract the DNA or RNA. We have to extract the proteins. We send them off. We make sure that it will run, that we actually will get data back. And we passed. Life is good. We're still on schedule. Space flight. Dun, dun, dun. All right, here we go again. 5.30 in the morning to set everything up, because it has to be set up in a time frame. So 5.30 a.m., we're even sort of happy at this point. Headed into the building, still the processing center in our lab. There are the plates ready to go. There are the plates getting light. There's the integration. This is about 6 a.m. that we're starting integration. Integration into the hardware. There we are again. That's me in that hat so that I can actually find myself in these pictures. Um, and all I'm doing at this point is giving them the science. <laughs> there they are, fixative. Now, you got to remember, that's five. That's one brick. We actually flew four. And then there were four ground controls. So two days later, you go through the whole process again to set up all the ground controls. Back to the bricks. There they are. Everybody gets weighed. That's how much a brick weighs. It is this big, about the size of an actual brick, and it weighs 17.7 .7 pounds. Off to the rocket. So this is the rocket on its side. This is our uh, model of the rocket. The first time I was down at Kennedy, I actually saw this rocket in one of the gift shops. And I thought, oh, I have to have it, <laughs> right? I have to have it. So I get it back. I come back with it. It's in the box. I'm just, no, it's the rocket. It's the exact model of the rocket we're going to fly. And I give it to Adam in my lab. And I say, you want to put this together? And he's like, yes. So then he comes to me and he says, he's got the box and he's got the piece of paper. And he says to me, I got it all together, except we need these couple of things. And then we need the launch stuff so that it'll launch. And I said, it launches. And he said, so we set it all up, and some of you may remember this from last year, and we had a launch party. It was supposed to be a simultaneous launch because we were going to go at two something in the afternoon. So all of these guys were here, and I was down at Kennedy, and we had all of our assignments. Everybody was ready to go, and we didn't launch. So I got this little phone call that said, um, what are we supposed to do? I said, launch it. <laughs> By that point, we had a little bit of a crowd. It's like, y'all launch and tell me what happens. They kind of got excited and nobody told me what happened. But eventually, they talked to me. So off to the rocket. It lays on its side because we're going to fly in the Dragon capsule up here. And they have to load it when it's on its side. Then they stand it up for launch. 
amazingly, we could drive almost right up to it. We're all in the van, and we're going, really? Nobody's going to stop us? We passed by this one. We passed by that one. Nobody had stopped us yet. And Darren and I are like, I, I don't know. And Darren looks at me and said, well, you're the one that's badged all the way through, so if we get stuck, they'll throw you in jail. <laughs> Nobody cared. So off to see the launch. We're ready. It's five something in the morning because the launch is supposed to go off at 618. We are in the van. This is my very first selfie ever. We are playing this music. We're playing this music. We're playing Rocket Band. We're playing Space Rocket. time my phone rang in a message and when you're at Kennedy there you have a liaison so there's a, an employee at Kennedy that talks to you because none of the engineers want to talk to the biologists so she's sort of the person I used to call her my handler because that was pretty much what she was doing handling me so I get a text and I look at it it's from her and you know how you can see that first little bit in a text it was a frowny face. That's not good. I have to admit, we're all there. None of us know exactly what to do at this point. It's not going anywhere. They found a problem, and the launch has been scrubbed. Yeah, exactly. So we went to the visitor center when it opened. And there's a model in the visitor center of the space station. It's for little kids to crawl through, you know, one of those models. So we all jammed ourselves in, and I took the second selfie of my life. We went to the space station, even if our stuff didn't. So, new launch, new date, do over. Here we go again. This felt like my life. Remember, there's another three bricks to go. Filling them all. Then they have to have the pressure test to make sure they don't leak. Back to the PDF use, back into the, the bricks. We flew four bricks. These are actually the four bricks we flew. They all are numbered. These bricks had never been to space. They'd always been used as ground controls. We were running out of bricks. <laughs> because once we have to disassemble, they go through this really long process of cleaning them and getting them all ready. And we were quite literally running out of bricks. If we'd had to, another delay, we would have been in real trouble. You had a question? Oh yeah, there were other experiments. Yep, up and down that hall, um, there were other experiments. Uh, one of my colleagues, there was another plant experiment that flew. It was a different hardware. Um, there was a uh, C. elegans, a worm experiment that was flying in bricks as well. So there are people up and down the hall. You have kind of your dedicated team that's working on brick 20, but the brick 19, brick 20, there were other experiments flying in different hardware. So there was a lot of stuff going into the Dragon, in addition to all the resupply. I mean, the Dragons are actually launching for resupply 
of the space station and we get the added benefit of having that little bit of extra room that we can put an experiment on. So there they are, back to being weighed, off to the rocket again, there's the rocket, off to see the launch. I have to admit, it never gets old. <laughs> Whoops, sorry. Yes. All the people that were helping with the experiment, she's asking about that. I took some of my students and people down with me, but all, most of the rest of the people are NASA employees. No, they're specialized in the hardware and flying the hardware. That's why they say ready for the science, because they really don't know or kind of even kind of care. They ask us. Yes. Yes, several experiments. It, it depended. If you remember at the very beginning when I was doing definition phase, there's a certain amount of time that it's in cold stasis. So depending on how long your time, your window was, you may not have had to redo it. So it really depended on how long that stasis was. We were what was called um, a late load. So we had to be loaded at the last possible minute because our timeline was short. So there are experiments and other stuff that can be loaded way in advance, but ours was loaded about 24 hours out. T minus 10, uh, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. And lift off of the SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket with Dragon, continuing the resupply chain to the International Space Station. Did you kick us in? OSMGC proceed to section 10.63. Stage 1 for motion. Just tell me it's over. <laughs> All right, that's enough, I guess. All right, so this is the Dragon. So once it launches and the Dragon deploys, what actually happens is the window, you have a window, so they're launching it and it's got to catch the space station. So what happens with the Dragon, because it's not manned, is it gets close enough and the astronauts on the space station take the mechanical arm and reach out and grab it and bring it in to the dock, okay? So there it is docked. And then the astronauts go and you know, open it all up. They bring the stuff out. You can see them bringing out the various different experiments. And then they unpack the experiment, take it out of the coal bags so that it will reach ambient temperature, and then the seeds will germinate. And then three days later, they stop the experiment. Um, this is an injector. This is actually my experiment. This is a, my, um, one of my bricks. There are these little ports, and they actually inject in, and the, that releases the pressure on that tube of fixative and deploys that into the um, Petri dish itself and floods the Petri dish. Okay. So then they load it back on the Dragon, and they send it back. All right, so everything's loaded. This is about 30 days later. It came back in February. Um, this comes back and it lands in California. It lands off the coast of California. They bring it into port in California. They repack it to freeze it, and then they drive it across the US. So they drive it to Ames first, and they unload whatever Ames Research Center had flying. Then they drive it to Johnson if there's anything that needs to be dropped off at Johnson. Then finally they drive it back to Kennedy and I go down to Kennedy. Colin went with me this time. This was Colin's trip to Kennedy. Um, and we deintegrate. So we're back in that cold room again, um, taking our experiments. So that's the Petri dish right there. Should I tell them about number 13? Okay. So 
all of this is going on, and I'm actually, I'm taking this picture, obviously, so I'm taking it. There's no pictures of me actually deintegrating because Colin was focused on what I was doing so that when he got to do it, he wouldn't mess it up. So just to make him feel really comfortable, I dropped one. Number 13 hit the floor. And everybody in the room went, And I picked it up. We scooped it all up. We got the paper towels. We actually packaged all of the paper towels. We wiped up the auger with all the stuff. We put it in a Ziploc bag, froze it, and brought it back to OU. <laughs> it's still a valuable space flight experiment. And then it was really funny because the NASA employee, this is Susan, uh, who's doing all this work for us, um, <laughs> she looked at me and she said, I'm so glad that wasn't me. <laughs> So we go down, we get it all, and then they drive it to us. So now they, we've taken it out of the hardware, we've packaged it back in liquid nitrogen, and they put it on the box. Do you guys remember last year, some of you that were here, I know some of you were here, um, there was a science cafe in February that was canceled. That was the day it came back. The weather had been beautiful. The guys called me, they said, you know, we're an hour out. Two hours later, with this huge snowstorm hitting us, it's like, where are they? But they finally made it. So we got that the February snowstorm. There's my box. It literally is the only thing on it. It's actually loaded at Kennedy. They locked down the back of the truck. I have to go out and witness and the unlock of the truck and ensure that definitely what's loaded and nothing's been tampered with. And then they give me the readout of the temperature of the truck the entire time it's been traveling to ensure that everything has happened perfectly. So we get it off. What I'm pointing at is actually critical space item. Here they are. I didn't keep the box. Somebody asked me that, did you keep the box? I said, no, but I kept all the stickers. <laughs> then I took it, then Colin wanted it, so he carried it. We brought it inside, we opened it up. Now this is full of dry ice. I wish we'd actually brought these over. One of the trips to NASA, I don't know if you can see that or not, they have oven mitts that look like gloves of spacesuits. So we bought a bunch of those. Um, so we use them for autoclave gloves and I was trying to use them to unpack this. Um, and there they are, all frozen. Those are the space flight samples. After they actually thawed, I mean, we still can't see if we got germination. This is flown, we've wasted all this time, it's been a month that it's up there, it's driven all the way across the country. We went to get it, we put it in the box, it's been shipped back up to us. We actually had to fly back in time to get it. We still didn't know if they had actually germinated because you can't tell when it's frozen because it's all white. Yep, yep, sorry. The seedlings need to be kept cold. At this point, the experiment's over and we fix them. And what we want to get out of these seedlings is the protein and the RNA. And that will degrade if it's at room temperature. So we need it to be frozen so that we can actually preserve the proteins and the uh, RNA. Okay? What fixing is, I've said that a lot, yeah. Okay, so fixing, what we used was a chemical fixative. That's what they're injecting. The one that we actually used is called RNA later. And the idea of it is it's a chemical solution that preserves RNA. I wasn't using it so much to preserve the RNA as I was to stop, to kill the cells, to stop the reaction so that that's one of the things that it will do. It will kill the plants. So I wanted them frozen in time both chemically and uh, literally by the time it came back, so that when we got them back, the only proteins and RNA that we got, or, or that was differentially expressed, was due to lack of gravity. You gotta remember, this is my control up there. Gravity's down here. 
I think of this very differently than many people. So then, yes, sorry. At space, they were ambient temperature, basically room temperature. So they were about 21 to 23, depending on what day it is. So we have all those data downlinked as well. I mean, they give it to us hourly for the entire time. Yes. They were frozen. They are frozen on the space station. So then we're analyzing the data. We are currently still analyzing the data. The data sets we get back are huge. We have a full proteomics um, analysis, all the proteins that are expressed while it's in space. So we have the soluble proteins. We also have all the membrane proteins. And then we have all the RNA. Um, Proma is doing wherever she is. There she is by the space station. She's doing the protein work, and uh, uh, Colin is doing the RNA work. And Morgan, right after. I'm sorry. Why did I want to find the RNA after it had germinated? Because the seedlings in space don't have gravity. Have you ever planted a seed? Did you plant it right side up? Who knows, right? You don't have to because the plant knows which way is up. In space, they don't know. They go every which way they don't know. And I'm trying to find that signal that the plant uses to figure out which way is up. Proma? How many proteins are there in a plant? This is a Arabidopsis. How many? I'll repeat it. 15,000 have been identified in plants. We got 3,000. So we got 3,000. It's a few data points to work through. Okay. There's about 25,000 genes in a Arabidopsis. So if you think about RNA, how many, you know, how many of these genes are being expressed at any one time? How many genes are you working with right now? Give me a rough number. 11,000. 11,000 genes. Okay. So the, the question was, did we look at any of the physical uh, aspects of the seedlings? And the answer is no. Um, because of the way our experiment works, we have to be in a closed environment and we don't get them back until they're flooded with RNA later and frozen. So whatever's, you know, we're not going to see good stuff. Now, there are experiments that actually do um, video imaging. And one of the microscopes or one of the imaging microscopes that's used on the space station is actually controlled from Glenn Space Station here in Ohio. It's really cool. That's the next field trip. Yes. OK, so he. Yes, he, he's actually, he's asking, you know, really, if you're flying in the space station, the perfect control is a 1G control in the space station. And there are, there is a centrifuge on the space station. One of my colleagues is flying actually a fractional G, so he's looking from zero to one G. Uh, and he's actually taking video, so he's going to get images of, I think there's 28 points in between he's looking at. It just, that's not my experiment. Um, you know, so it just depends on how you want to set the experiment up. There's a huge array of possibilities, and they really try to do a nice job of, NASA tries to do a really nice job of um, uh, helping the science. The International Space Station is a science station. So the idea of trying to facilitate as much science as humanly possible. And I'm going to leave you with this one. Explore. This is the entrance to the Kennedy Visitor Center. And the idea, the rockets are in behind it, the original rockets, the red stones, uh, the Apollos, where the Apollos and the Gemini and the Mercuries went off. Um, that idea of exploring everything, exploring both the, the molecular and the biochemistry of how things work, but also exploring our universe. Yes, sir. 
The method we use to identify the proteins. Chroma? It's my, yeah, it was all done with through mass spec. Um, and if you want to talk about the nitty gritty details, Promo would love to discuss those. I'm not sure everybody else would enjoy that conversation, but maybe. Yes. Yes. So the question here was, since I consider the space flight the control, NASA really kind of doesn't, but I do, um, it, are my controls treated the same? So there's a set of controls that are run at Kennedy in two, on a two-day lag, and all the environmental information is downlinked from the space station, so it's exactly the same. It's in all the hardware. It's treated exactly the same. It goes in the freezer exactly at the same time, because you're never quite sure, depending on um, astronaut availability, there's, a, another, there's an, a window, right? So they have to do it, they have to fix it in a certain window of time, but you're never quite sure when that's gonna be. So they give you all that information. Um, you know, this is one of those things, they would call me and they would tell me, and I was taking notes. This is our timeline, original timeline, and then you can see me scribbling down here at all the things, because one of the things that we did was we also did we also did uh, Ohio controls. So we set up two um, full sets here in Ohio to run them exactly the same to make sure that all of our parameters were correct. So we actually had three controls run plus the space flight material. Um, is there like one more question? We're running out of time. So, I mean, everybody is welcome to come up and look at these things. I actually have some of the plates that flew uh, after we, got most of the seedlings off of them. Um, and there's a variety of other things here. Our plants, um, our lab mascot. His name is Gene. Put it together, Gene Ohm. Okay. Uh, I am not a comedian. Oh, not a comedian. Uh, okay, so um, you're welcome to go see the space station. It actually moves. Um, it's our, the model. Uh, Proma's there, Jeremy, Alan, Chris, Colin, Ann, Adam, they're all here to talk to you. Cactus is over there. Evan is here. If you want to see the rocket, you're welcome to see that as well or to look at any of the other stuff that we have. Thank you very much.